Oh, it's a great honor. Josh Yuji, how you doing, man? Doing great. Happy to be here. So I've been uh, yeah. counting down, uh, you know, the days since uh, you invited me on. Yeah, well, listen, man, uh, you get invited when you do incredible things and you're doing them, man. So um, we want to we want to learn from the best here. And, uh, and and you're having incredible success, not only at Tennessee and what you're doing with the, the men and women these days on the sprint side of things, um, collectively as a team as well, but specifically, or, you know, right now, I guess, with Jordan Crooks. So congrats on that, man. Yeah, no, thanks. I, I appreciate uh, the kind words there. Um, you know, I think uh, the team and, and Jordan is in a great spot. You know, it's just, it's a good time. Yeah. Well, you know, you're, you're, you're at home now. You're, you're on a break, which is nice. you got some clarity of thought. You can take a deep breath. I mean, you're halfway through the season. Just give us kind of the update on on where we're at with the Tennessee team right now. Yeah. No, you know, we're, we're halfway through, right? Um, you know, I think we're, we're hitting our stride, you know, as, as with any season, there's moving pieces, you know, some highs, some lows and everything in between. Um, but, you know, I think, uh, fall invite, we began to see some, uh, some great things, some good momentum from the squad, you know, and that carried through to a, a strong U S open performance, um, then at Brazilian nationals and, uh, world champs, you know, so I think, uh, both squads, the men and the women are, are beginning to really, uh, you know, build some nice energy, you know, going into the, the championship segment. Tell us what it's like specifically <clears throat> at the start of each season. It's always a challenge, right? You get these new athletes coming in, you get your freshmen coming in, you lose some of your best athletes. Maybe they uh, retire. Um, maybe they maybe they go into the pro squad. So they take a different approach, different look. Um, but but everything's changing, you know, that that the start of the fall season, right? And here we are halfway through. So you've had to deal with learning a new group of people, losing some of your best athletes, figuring out who the team is, um, getting them in the type of shape that you want them to get in to, to be super fit. And and all this in kind of like four months, it's a, it's a big ask, right? Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a big ask, but it's a, it's, it's a fun one, right? And, you know, there's so many different moving pieces associated with the start of any season, right? You know, I think for us, specifically at Tennessee, we, we have a lot of international athletes on the, the team um right now and you know i think historically there's been a good amount but right now we've got a, a bunch um from different countries represented um and that i think that just creates a really cool dynamic where you know you're bringing in people from all around the world um you know the the current roster that's been there for a year or two or three you know it's just it's an infusion of energy um and and coach matt you know matt credits our head coach he does a great job of just kind of setting the tone from from day one with integration right you know we we do some things as a team in the beginning of the year to, to help build stronger bonds. Um, you know, we go take a trip to the beach where, you know, we don't even really swim. We just kind of do dry land and take surf lessons and things like that, you know? And so I mm -hmm. think the building blocks for beginning the year are really sound at Tennessee. And, you know, it starts with Matt and then it carries through, through the team, you know? Yeah. In terms of, um, you know, building out a season, right? Like I think most of the teams these days, most of the NCAA teams are looking at probably swimming fast <clears throat> somewhere around this time, you know, like in December, you want to, you want to maybe suit up and go fast. Uh, pretty much everybody's doing that these days. So <clears throat> in terms of when you guys are breaking down the season plan, uh, obviously there's a, there's a period of time where you got to get them into shape. You got to get them fit. Um, What's your approach early with that with that initial phase of like learning these freshman kids, getting them into shape, getting them ready for a few months to, to race fast in terms of the, the total outlook of the season, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, again, a, a lot of different uh, skill sets and ability levels, I think, from from any newcomer um, as they come in. Right. You know, I think uh, I think we do a pretty good job of not not doing a one, one size fits all approach, mm. not taking one size fits all approach, you know, so we've got some kids that, uh, you know, well, I guess I'll talk specifically like within the lower portion of our, our team, but, you know, some people that have maybe a little bit more of an aerobic background um, versus some other kids that, that don't really have that. And I think we do a good job of maybe uh, contacting coaches, trying to better understand, um, you know, what each athlete's coming from, you know, throughout the, the months leading up to their arrival to campus um, mm -hmm. communicating with the athletes to better understand like what what's in their wheelhouse and then trying to appropriately challenge them um, as they're there with us, you know, uh, in the trenches, you know, as we're, we're getting mm -hmm. underway. 
Um, yeah. What's the approach uh, from Matt's side of things? Does Matt say, all right, the first month, everybody's going to stay together? Or is it like initially we're going to break into groups fairly early on? And, and you know, where, where's your role fit into that uh, early in the season? Yeah, so again, every year has been slightly different uh, for me here. You know, Matt uh, Matt is always looking for ways to do things better. I think uh, foundationally, the first two to three weeks for us every year since I've been here at Tennessee, there's a lot of learning and education. Um, you know, we're trying to help the athletes understand the way that we're communicating, like the terminology that we use. Um, you know, Matt's doing breakdowns with uh, PowerPoints of what we're going to be trying to teach them from a technical standpoint and things like that. Um, early on in the season, there's times that the whole team's together, men and women combined. There's times that we're separated men and women. And then there's times that we begin, you know, I guess further in, you know, three, four weeks in, we're beginning to break out into maybe a lower and an upper or maybe subgroups within those kind of two primary worlds. Um, so a lot of moving pieces within it. But, you know, I think we kind of sprinkle in a little bit, a little bit of it all as we're trying to begin the season, you know? Mm. Yeah, and I, and I know Matt has primarily used your role as kind of the the sprint guy, the sprint focus. What's your background there? Like, t tell us a little bit about you, where you've come from, and and why you've kind of leaned into the sprint side of things. Yeah, so um, I think I have a pretty unique background. Um, I swam in college at a Division two school, um, Indiana University of Pennsylvania, um, under Chris Villa. Uh, Great, great guy, great, great coach, um, really instilled a, a deeper love of the sport, I think, in me just through his energy. Um, so I did my undergrad and my master's there, um, coached there for two seasons, um, had the opportunity to then go on to the College of William & Mary with Matt Crispino, um, who's now at Princeton. Um, you know, and I think there, um, I guess I kind of began what I would say is my my sprinting coaching, coaching career, uh, Matt. Mm. Uh, had me start working with the sprinters there for for my couple years, um, you know, with the tribe that carried over to to Virginia Tech. Um, I was there for four seasons um, uh, and kind of fell into a sprint role there as well for for each of my seasons there. And then that carried over to to Tennessee, um, where I'm in my fourth season as well. Um, so you know, I think it's just one of those things that I've over the last maybe nine, ten years just kind of been more uh oriented towards the sprint world um and I, I like it you know it's uh fast paced and you know there's a lot of uh uh moving pieces with the athletes you get to work with and, and never really any uh dull moments you know so i think i i enjoy uh that world you know yeah it, it's a it's a fun one because you get to experiment you get to play and i think sprinting is still one of those areas that um may not be as understood as as kind of maybe the the distance arena like we we have a fairly firm grasp on how to get someone fit and and fast in distance right like um you know there, there's there's systems there's approaches that have been tried and tested for you know many many years now by many of the world's leading coaches and i think in a way that most of the swimmers were kind of brought up in that system of like let's build the aerobic base and and you know and and go from there so i think sprinting is is definitely still young in its experimentation and so in terms of the learnings about how to get someone to swim fast i mean you're still we're all still learning we're all still growing but where where have been some of the areas of your education so that you've dug into that to say that's the type of sprinting i want to do that's the type of sprint coach i want to be kind of thing yeah no definitely you know i think uh, as you said you're, you're always learning right you know and i think yeah the barriers of the sport are constantly being just, you know, broken through, right? You know, mm -hmm. there there aren't really barriers right now as, you know, people are just swimming insanely fast, you know, from the age group, you know, level up to, you know, whatever. Um, and so I, I think the biggest thing is just kind of learning from everybody that you can. You know, everybody's doing it, you know, maybe there's some similarities with how people are doing it, but a lot of the time it's being done different ways. And so, you know, having conversations with different coaches, you know, watching video of, of what different people are doing. And I think mo most importantly, learning from the athletes you're, you're working with. You know, I think that that's probably the biggest, biggest thing that's been helpful for me is just kind of learning from who you have, right? You know, when I first got there at Tennessee, you know, Erica Brown, um, she's, she's an amazing athlete, you know, and the way she moves through the water is 
you know, maybe up until now is, was different than how I had seen from most athletes, right? You know, what she's able to do underwater, above water, the feel that she has, things like that, you know, and you just kind of take notes, right? Like while you're watching them day in and day out. And I think, you know, that's something that I've carried through each season at Tennessee. Um, it's just trying to learn from from others and who, who you got, you know, and I think every – Every day is an opportunity to to tinker with something and you know trial and error here and there. Um, and it's it's just kind of that constant pursuit of knowledge, you know. Yeah. Well, let's get into it then, man. Let's let's get into Jordan a little bit. I mean, obviously, just uh, won a world title, and um, you know, I had him on my podcast probably a year ago or something like that when he was first coming through, and you were doing work with him, and he was telling me all the reasons why he chose Tennessee and why he's happy there and why he's progressing and. And he was just kind of hitting his stride a little bit and people were starting to notice him. And then all of a sudden, boom, you know, a couple of days ago, he wins a world title and everyone's like, okay, who the hell is this kid? So like come, come from nowhere, beat and um, beat the best in the world. I mean, beat Ben Proud. I mean, Ben Proud basically won everything there is to win this season. And uh, except this last race here, you know, where, where Jordan beats him. So um, where did you start with Jordan? And, and we can kind of progress to where he is today. But when you first got him, where was he? Uh, you know, I think when uh, when he first came to Tennessee, well, I'll even backtrack a little bit, right? You know, when we went through the recruiting process with him, it was, you know, a little unique. It was uh, right at the beginning of COVID. Um, you know, the first time that we met him was at, you know, the Tier Pro Series in Knoxville that we were hosting. And, uh, you know, we, we had a conversation with him at the end of the, the meet. Um, you know, we had seen some things from him, the way he moved in the water, what he was doing underwater. You could tell he had skills. Um, you know, but one of the biggest things um, that, that we took away from kind of our, our moment with him was, you know, just his, his background in the Cayman Islands of, you know, you know, spear fishing and being able to hold his breath and things like that. You know, I think in our first conversation, he's like, yeah, I can hold my breath for like three minutes. You know, I'm like, dude, you, you've got a spot. You know, that's awesome. Um, and so, you know, fast forward a year, uh, you know, we had that moment with him, recruited him over the phone because COVID happened and, you know, I hadn't seen him since, since that moment, you know, and he arrived to campus, stepped out of his car with his parents, you know, I think he'd grown like two inches and put on 30 pounds of muscle, you know, I think he was just lifting mm -hmm. weights. Um, but, you know, so he arrived with, you know, this, this great frame, great mindset. He comes from a fantastic family, family and just a, a great individual. And he was just kind of hungry to learn, you know, so. He kind of came in just with eyes wide open. You know, he 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 was talented, you know, and I think it was just uh, the open mindedness that allowed him just to kind of take it all in from the very beginning. You know, and so, uh, you know, first couple of practices, you know, you start seeing some things in the water where you're like, wow, you know, this kid, he's he's got a lot of power in the water. You know, he's he's got a great feel underwater The you know, the, the feel on top of the water, I think, was something that was still we still are helping him kind of develop that, you know, he's. He's definitely more of a power guy versus a finesse guy. Um, but, you know, I think the first year was all about him kind of believing and learning more about himself, maybe at a higher level. You know, I think he knew that he he was good and or could be good, but I don't think he knew just how fast or how far he could take the sport. And so, you know, year one, I'd say, was was just about developing belief. And now we're beginning to kind of see that, that true belief in his capabilities. You know, he's now – uh, I think becoming more and more a student of the sport. You know, he's he's now reaching out to us and he's like, hey, I you know, I watched this this video of you know of Ben, right? You know, and he does this, you know, what do you think about that? Or, you know, hey, I, I watch a video on my own from this dual meet, you know, I don't think I got this great of a jump off the wall. You know, what do you think about me landing this way? You know, things like that. And so you know, I think one of the biggest transformations from year one to year two is just his understanding and and thirst for knowledge of of getting better. And as that knowledge and, and hunger is kind of growing, it allows us to kind of throw more and more at him, right? You know, or we're able to have higher level conversations with him. We're able to push him further in different ways, you know, and, and he still has that open mindedness where, you know, I think the trust is there where he's like, all right, you know, if you guys want to, you want to try this, let's, you know, let's go ahead. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think he talked about it in a, an interview like two weeks ago. He was talking about just the change in his stroke counts. Um, I think he was saying he was like 11 strokes or something like that in his first 25, you know, and the kid can just go to tempo um, like, like no, nobody else, you know, he's able to just kind of spin his wheels and, and go. Um, I don't, I don't know if he was quite 11 strokes, but I know when he was, you know, 19 or 18, five last season, I think he was like nine strokes out 
10 strokes back this year when he was 18 two, he was seven strokes out, nine strokes back, you know, so just some of the challenges that we've thrown at him of, Hey, you know, let's, let's look for more length, you know, let's try to hold more water, you know, instead of just going right. Um, you know, I think just his openness to, to improvement, you know, is, is making all the difference, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> well, it, it's good. I, like, I like what you're saying there in terms of like, you're, you, you haven't, you haven't completely figured it all out yet. And, and yet here he is winning world titles and swimming really fast and you're still playing, you're still learning, you're still growing. That's exciting, man. That's really exciting. That's where, that's where you're like, okay, there's no real limits here yet. Like we, we haven't hit a limit. We're still, we're still experimenting here and we're still learning how to go really fast. And so that's fun. I, I loved what you said there. Three things that really I picked up on there was like, yeah, he has talent, right? Like you, you got to have talent to be that good. Um, mm -hmm. But then he comes in and he's got a mindset where he's like an open book, like teach me, you know, make me better. I mean, yeah. when you put talent and that kind of mindset together, it reminds me of a guy that I coached a while back, Zach Apples. Zach made these huge improvements so quickly and people were like, well, how's he doing it? And it's like, well, he's talented. He's He, he, he just eats whatever you're feeding him. He'll eat it, yeah. right? Just give it to me. You know, and then he's doing the study. That's the other thing you told. You just said he's doing the study. He's, he's watching the greats. He's learning. He's watching Dressel, and then he knows. Yeah, I got to get up and get get against these guys, but yeah. I'm going to learn from them. What are they doing well? What can I incorporate? And maybe what could I do better than them? And that's the thing right. is, that's what you do in order to get better. Is yeah, you you take what you can from the best, but you also say, well, where can I be better than them? And then yeah. you incorporate that into your training as well. And that's when you go to a whole nother level. So. That's exciting, man. That's exciting. That's um, let's do this then. Let's let's go into a couple of specifics then. If you could tell us a couple of things. I'm, I'm just going to hit you with a couple of things. So um, improvement of power. When you guys are looking to improve his power, what are, what are something that you're doing specifically uh, maybe on a weekly basis to improve his power? Um, you know, I think it, it probably fluctuates, right? You know, if we're talking about underwater power, we're, we're trying to, mm -hmm. um, you know, challenge him in, in different ways, right? You know, we've been doing, uh, obviously, we use a lot of racks, um, you know, as we, we think, think about power in general, racks, towers, socks, shoots, things like that. Um, we've been doing a lot this season specifically of uh, underwater work with parachutes, you know, where we're asking them to, to stop and go, you know, to go from a glide where they're holding their breath into, um, you know, dropping a chute and trying to, to get to tempo and, and maintain it for varying distances, things like that. Um, a lot mm. of it is just like how they're, how they're applying like that, that force, right. And then, and carrying it through the resistance elements that we're throwing at them. Um, so, you know, I think uh, what we're doing underwater is maybe a little bit different than what we're doing on top of it. Um, you know, with our, our above water progressions this season, you know, I think uh, going back to, to length, right? You know, I think we started a little bit differently this season where, you know, we challenged them to slow down, right? And just learn how to mm. actually hold water through an entire stroke, right? You know, wow. for different tempos and things like that, which is a little bit different than maybe what has been done in the past um, with them where, you know, we, we, you know, throw them on to different, uh, you know, power tools, right? And, and they would go, they would, you know, crank is a strong word, but they would, you know, just go fast when we were, throwing resistance at them. And, you know, it was almost like a rewiring of, you know, hey, we want you to try to go at, you know, 200 tempo, you know, on a rack with, you know, a specific amount of weight. And let's see how many strokes we're, we're holding. Let's see how, you know, if we can stay within this range. Um, and I think that that was probably one of the biggest things in, in terms of the improvement of, uh, you know, Jordan's yeah, ability to hold water, right? You know, as he's going fast, is just learning to actually hold water. Um, and obviously, we've begun to uh, go maybe into a little bit more traditional um, power, right, where, you know, we are now going fast on racks, on towers, you know, with cords and things like that. Um, but we, you know, I think this season we we started out slow to go fast. Mm, that's a that's a key, man. Um, it's, it's probably it's probably why I got out of the game, too, because I was doing that. I was doing that years ago and there was a couple of people that had figured it out, but but not everybody. And now it seems like everybody's starting to catch on to that as like, in order to, in order to go fast, you got to learn how to swim slow. It's such a key, man. And, and you're, you're hitting the nail on the head with that. I think that's so crucial. So many people just want to get into going fast swimming and they don't realize, Hey, first thing you got to learn is how to hold the water. Right. And then you got to learn how to apply power to that, to that hold. Right. And so that, that's awesome. I love what you're doing there. 
I would I would encourage you to keep doing that because that's really going to take every one of your swimmers to the next level. Um, so that's really cool. And then in terms of specific, like a, like a, a, uh, a shoot set, I had to get that out of my mouth, a shoot yeah. set that you would do underwater. Um, what's an example of a shoot set you'd do underwater? Yeah, so there's tons of variations. Um, you know, we, we try to keep it consistent, but we, we do try to spice it up, you know, here and there. One thing that we did, you know, probably, you know, shortly after invite, right, as we were gearing up for, um, you know, short course worlds and things like that, just kind of post invite. Um, you know, we've got uh, a sequence that we've been doing where, you know, the athletes are, you know, they're holding on to a parachute. Um, we'll go a couple rounds of this, but, you know, they're pushing off the wall. We're thinking about the line they're trying to hold. You know, I think that line's different for everybody, but so they're pushing off the wall, maybe trying to hold it for eight yards, 10 yards, 12 and a half yards, right? And so you're, you're trying to, to maintain a line. You're doing a submerged turn underwater. As you're, you know, doing a submerged turn, you're dropping your chute. And then we've got different tempos that we're trying to have them then, you know, race back to the wall at, you know, with that shoot out, you know, so there's elements of, you know, breath control, you know, obviously included within that. And then the challenge of stop and go with, you know, resistance at varying distances and things like that. Um, you know, that's one that we've been doing somewhat recently that we really like. All right, hang on a second. I got, I'm trying to get a visually. So when you say hold on to the shoot, are they holding the shoot actually out in front? Like how are they doing it? Yeah, so they've got the shoot kind of bunched up in their hands, right? Some of them have mastered different, you know, holds of it. But let's just say, you know, universally, they're all holding it. They're in a streamline, right? So they're and they're, is the cord you know, behind your back or underneath your stomach? So uh, we've kind of left it open ended for them of how how they feel comfortable with it, right? You know, um, I think some, primarily, most of them are probably having it over their over their like from their back over their shoulder and kind of holding mm. it like that. Right. And then as they submerge you know, or as they uh, they turn, you know, they're letting it go. And then having to jumpstart that a little bit, um, so you know that's one that we've been doing that you know I think we've been seeing some pretty pretty good benefits from. Um, mm -hmm. We do a lot of sequences where they're using socks, whether it be socks with you know over fins, where they're doing you know we do a lot of core engagement with some fly kick on your back into some different underwater sequences, things like that. A lot of it is just kind of core engagement, how we're trying to move and flow into just quick bursts and things like that. Right. We individualize training in the pool, so why not individualize your nutrition? Erica Biney of Biney Wellness Building will help you and your swimmers get exactly what each athlete needs through genetic testing and personalized nutrition plans. So stop guessing what you should and shouldn't be putting into your body. Athletes within a few weeks have noticed they're recovering faster because they're fueling their body with what they need and staying away from what their body hates. Erica understands swimming. She gets it. She's worked with over 20 Olympians, including the fastest man in the world, Caleb Dressel. Group discounts are available. So go to Biney Wellness Building and get in touch with Erica today. That's Biney, B-E-I-N-E, wellnessbuilding.net. Now, I did this overview of, uh, of, of Caleb and Jordan kind of doing some dolphin kicking. It looks like Jordan has a little bit more movement up front with, with his arms. Um, how do you guys feel about that? How do you teach that? And, you know, obviously everyone's going to do a slightly different variation that's going to work for them, I think. And I think sometimes we get caught up in like, well, that's how Caleb does it. So that's how everybody has to do it. Whereas Jordan's got a little bit more movement, but he seems to be just as effective. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, no, definitely. And I think, again, it's it's what is each athlete's strengths, right, ability. Um, and, and to some degree, that's something that we've been kind of playing off with Jordan, right? You know, the way he kicks underwater is different from how uh, Guy Caribe kicks underwater. Um, you know, both really good underwater guys, but, you know, just different skill sets. And so we've actually this season been doing a lot of mobility work, Monday mornings, Wednesday mornings, even some Friday mornings. We take about 30 minutes to go through different mobility sequences with them. Um, and, and then carry that into, I mean, for the most part, specific underwater work with them. Um, so for, you know, I think across the board with our athletes, and you know, we talk about where we're trying to get that under underwater movement to, to begin that harmonic movement. You know, so we're talking about it starting from the chest, how they want to carry it through. Um, there's some sequences that we've been doing this year where, you know, we've been doing a lot of S kick, um, you know, and, and we'll actually have them, you know, begin with their, their arms, you know, open, you know, and just trying mm -hmm. to open up their chest with that mm -hmm. movement and then it carries into, you know, what they're doing in a streamline, you know, within a, an underwater harmonic movement. 
And then it go, builds into like distance per kick where they're trying to get across the pool and as few kicks as they can. So, you know, they're creating that, that power and then they're being asked to ride it. Right. And then mm-hmm. it goes into some building into tempo, some fast exits, things like that. Um, that's a sequence that we've been doing a lot of. Um, and I think it's really kind of helped Jordan. Um, and again, he's one end of the spectrum just with the movement that he has, but just the increased mobility and like learning how to kind of open up his chest a little bit in that, I think is what you see kind of in that comparison video, which I saw, which was awesome to kind of see that um, yeah. between the two of them. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I, lo- I love the fact that you're not boxing people in either. They're, everyone's slightly different. And I think that like, yeah, I, I mean, I think sometimes you look at it and you say, well, if we did this, we could reduce resistance. But then you also say, well, if I if I take that away from you, it's going to affect something else, which then is going to affect your flow. So as long as you're flowing and you're going forward fast, I think ultimately it doesn't really matter how you're doing as long as it works for you. But as, as long as the effect is still the same thing is that you're going as fast as you possibly can. And I think that's sure. where Jordan is with this. Um, one of the things I, I did notice that I think is crucial too, you know, Jordan obviously got out in that 100 free um, you know, super fast. And, and I wouldn't want to change that from him. Like that mentality of that, that racehorse mentality of like get out front and go and use your strengths. I love that. But then there's the, the Kyle Chalmers effect of like, hey, someone's going to swim over the top of me. So you got to consider the speed endurance. You got to consider how you're coming home. So when you're, when you're going to factor those things in in the future of like, okay, Jordan, we've got the top end speed. No one in the world can touch you there, but we've also got to finish the race better. How how do then we incorporate some of that speed endurance to get him home as well? Like what what would be some example sets that you'd do with him, you think? Yeah, so, um, you know, again, I think it kind of depends on where we're at um, in the season and what we're doing, but we do a lot of things with them, you know, just repeat 25s, repeat 37 and a half, you know, where they're being asked to, you know, maintain a stroke count, being asked to put in a tempo trainer, maintain tempo, um, you know, breathing pattern, you know, all of that just at a high level under duress, right? You know, where they're getting that that race endurance, that speed endurance in while incorporating or being consistent with that skill set, you know, and I think, you know, I think if you were to ask Jordan, right, I think he was in the final at, at Short Course Worlds, I think he was out 21-3 to his feet, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. you know, and and I think if you asked him, he, he'd probably respond, oh, man, you know, it's, I just took it up just a gear too high, right? And and for him, sometimes, you know, he's still learning, like, you don't have to to crank to go fast, right? Again, it's that slow is fast sometimes. And he's able to to just go so easily that, you know, that, that little change, um, you know, in that first 25, right? You know, sometimes he, he'll amp it up and maybe he gets one less breath in. Right, um, you know, within that first 25, and, and he pays for it on the back end, and that's something that he's still learning. And I think immediately after the race, you know, if, if you sat down with him, you probably be like, ah, man, you know, that that wasn't exactly the plan. But I think it's just kind of learning, you know, being being in that situation, um, and and just kind of keeping his cool, you know. And yeah. I think uh, as the meet went on, you know, every time he walked out of the ready room or the call room, you know, I think he got more and more comfortable. I remember after the first one, I, I wasn't out there. But, you know, I think he was like speed walking out of there just because, you know, the, the nerves were there. And so, you know, just being on that stage and getting those reps in and rehearsal, I think will allow him to hopefully, you know, one day go out 21-3 and not not pay for it on the back end, right? It's just how do you do that the right way? And, again, it's just staying in process and and, and what you know, you know. Yeah. Where, where is he at long course right now? What's his best times long course? Yeah, so he was uh, – I think he went from 50.0 to 48.7 last summer in the 100. And mm-hmm. from 22.8 to 22.2, 22.1 um, in the 50, which right. were you know, pretty good drops. Um, you know, we've, we've done some long course things this season um, where I think he's probably, you know, in store for some pretty good drops long course as well. Uh, but again, it's just kind of learning how to, to swim those long course, right? He was obviously such a skilled, you know, athlete underwater. It's just, you know, trying to help him now figure out, you know, a little bit more swimming, a little less underwaters, right? And, you know, how are you able to, to sustain maybe a tempo that's, you know, a notch below what that short course yards tempo is, you know, so on and so forth. Um, yeah. But, you know, I think 22-2 and 48-7 is where he's been at long course thus far. Not bad, not bad. Good good uh, jumps forward. And, and, yeah, you're right. He's got some more leaps forward to make for sure. And it, it's difficult when you're in the midst of a, a short course season and you're, and you're focused on the yards to really be – thinking, well, I've got to improve my long course. He's got plenty of time for that, obviously. But, you know, Paris is coming around and, 
he's going to be a contender there um, with the, with his experience and and his growth and and so that yeah he's definitely going to want to be in you know that that 21 low range and that that 47 low range so he's he's still got some big drops to make and and those will have to come um, what do you see you know obviously your focus is the short course season but like how how do you translate that into long course as soon as the short course season's over? Do you give him a little break and then say, hey, we're just going to go all long course work? How do you guys incorporate that in the summer? Yeah, so, I mean, even right now we're incorporating long course. Um, you know, okay. we're anywhere between three to three to four practices long course a week right now. Oh. Um, oh, okay. you know, so we are still giving them, you know, those doses of that, um, you know, throughout right. the season then. You know, as we get closer to, to 2024, you know, those those number of practices, even during the collegiate season, will continue to, to increase, you know, just because that's the main goal, right? You know, is to put people in positions to achieve on the highest levels, right? While not sacrificing what we're trying to accomplish, short course yards. Um, you know, and I think that's that's a testament to Matt kind of in the big picture thought process with the program, you know, it's just kind of year round keeping that long course focus there. So it's not foreign for them, you know, as we transition out of the, the NCAA season into the big pool, right. You know, we want them to be familiar with it and, and not really have any transition time. Um, you know, once we do get out of the NCAA season, you know, I think we go um, like this past, you know, I guess April through August, right. You know, I think we were probably six to seven practices a week, long course uh, with maybe some recovery practices for the lower group, um, short course yards. Um, you know, so it, it does kind of flip flop a little bit, um, as soon as, uh, NCAAs are over, but we do keep that, you know, just kind of year round focus. Yeah. What's his third event? I guess he's doing the hundred fly I'd imagine. Right. Yeah. You know, uh, right now I'd probably say it's hundred fly. He was uh 44 seven during our, uh, our invite. Um, you know, and I think that okay. that sets up well, um, you know, so 100 fly is probably where we're going to lean. He was 45 mid, 100 back as well. Um, just swam in a, in a prelim, though. So I think he probably nice. could be a little quicker there. Uh, but I think right now we're kind of leaning towards that 100 fly. Yeah, nice. All right, man. Well, give us the outlook of the, the Tennessee team. I mean, the women have been knocking on the door. They, you know, you've won some SEC titles and knocking on the door for an NCAA championship. And then the men are... Uh, are getting stronger and stronger, obviously, with a guy like Jordan leading the way. You guys are contending. Uh, we able to contend in many different areas. So w where are we at with the two teams? Yeah, man, we're just we're just trying to run with it, right? You know, um, I think uh, I'll start with the men, right? You know, I think we've got some good momentum right now. Um, you know, obviously with uh, with guys like Jordan and and Guy and you know some other some of the other guys on the roster doing what they're doing. You know, we're beginning to um, I think recruit. Uh, I don't want to say better, right? But we're beginning to bring in some athletes that are able to help us, um, you know, right away at a, a higher level. You know, some guys that I think you know, can come in and score right away at NCAAs or mm. put themselves in a position to be in multiple finals, um, you know, A or B at, at SECs, which is is great. I think that's a great step forward for, you know, where the men, um, you know, have been at and where we want to head, right? You know, obviously um, the Florida men have, have done a great job over the last, you know, last couple of years, um, you know, and for us to beat them, you know, we've got to fire on all, on all cylinders and and continue to recruit better. Um, but, you know, I think for us within the season, you know, the men were second at SECs last year. You know, I think we've got some belief that, you know, we can we can take a run, you know, into the the point gap um, that was between us and, and Florida on the men's side. Um, you know, we, we want to break into the top 10, top eight at NCAAs on the men's side. You know, we feel like the relays are at a, a spot right now where we're going to be able to, to put multiple, you know, up in the, the A final, um, which obviously helps the cause there. Um, you know, but I think that's kind of the immediate goal for the the men. Um, on the women's side, you know, like you said, we've won, won uh, a few SEC championships the last uh, couple of years. Um, the women have been consistently top 10. Um, and we just want to keep taking steps forward, you know, at the NCAA level, you know, to, to, to take a run at a title. Um, you know, that's that's the ultimate goal of the program, you know, is to, to try to win titles, um, you know, and on both sides. Right. You know, continuing to recruit at a high level and, and then to continue to develop athletes at a, a higher level, you know, is the, the recipe. Right. The recipe for success. And that's what we're trying to do. What about that balance then? Like when you're when you're in a situation where you you can contend for an SEC title, but then you're probably only going to be maybe top eight in the country or maybe, maybe shoot for a top five. Is it then, you know, part of the coaching staff say, well, we, let's get together and say, well, 
let's just let's just win the SEC and and try and, and see if we can hang on for an NCAA title, or is the mindset like we'll, we'll do what we can at the SEC level and then really take a run at the NCAA? So that balance between trying to figure out which title to try and take a run at is really difficult, right? Yeah, you know it's difficult, and you know I, I'll say like you know, I think we're we're believers that 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 you can swim fast at both, right? You know, and so we we want to. Uh, we want to swim fast, you know, period. Um, you know, I think it's one of those things that, you know, obviously the NCAA focus is, is a, a massive one. You know, we want to be the best program on a, a national stage as we can be. Um, but in that thought process, I don't think you also have to sacrifice preparation for the SEC championships. And so, you know, I think, uh, I think my, my response, my answer is just, you know, we just want to swim fast, period. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, I get it, man. I've been there, no doubt. But I think the the biggest the biggest drops, the biggest chunks of uh, you know the teams that make the biggest runs generally the NCAA's they come in at a certain time, you know they're they're pretty solid, but then they obviously make a big drop at the NCAA's, and that's where you kind of your whole team like if you've got a whole team dropping time at NCAA's rather than kind of just matching their times, mm -hmm. then you, you seem to make a bigger run, you know, and I think that's where that's where the Stanford's, uh, I mean the the Cal and and Texas, you know, especially on the men's side, have had had a had a better run at that, you know, in terms of making that that drop between conference and NCAA is really helps rather than just swimming really fast at SECs and then really fast NCAs, but not making those big drops. And it's uh, it's definitely a, definitely a fine balance, man. It's tough, yep. but you guys seem to be figuring it out and and doing an amazing job and. And listen, man, I got all the respect in the world for Matt Credich. I think he's one of the best in the business. So you got a great mentor there as well, you know? No, absolutely. Um, you know, obviously uh, coming to Tennessee, you know, getting to work with Matt, you know, is a, a, a massive draw, right? You know, and I always joke, you know, I, my office is right next to his, you know, and go in, ask him a simple question, you know, and then we're nerding out for 45 minutes over his, you know, his response, you know, and so – just the wealth of knowledge that Matt brings and, and more importantly, the way he handles himself on a daily basis. It's, it's a massive piece for me, you know, in, in my coaching career of, you know, where I want to go and who I, you know, want to learn from, you know? Yeah. How do you, how do you balance out the, uh, the, this, this kind of notion of experimenting, having fun, playing, you know, um, you know, challenging with the sprint group. And yet over the other side, you've got your 400 IMs and your distance swimmers just grinding it out. Like how's that balance for you in terms of being that type of sprint coach who can, who can really light up the deck, you know, like that, that's what I wanted to be that guy that like made it magic for the sprinters to want to come in. And that's what sprinters need. They need that stimulation, you know? So, but it's a tough balance when you got the 400 IMs and the distance swimmers over there just smashing it out. And, you're, and they're like, why are those guys having all the fun over there? You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's definitely a balance, right? I think um, I think our team does a great job of understanding that everybody needs a couple different food groups, right? You know, I think, you know, we, we had a couple kids, right? You know, one of the spectrum, we had a couple kids that were on the U.S. world champ team for open water, right? You know, they're, they're one end of the spectrum, you know, and then we've got athletes that, you know, were on the world champ team for the, the 50. Um, mm. And so I think there's just a, a – an understanding of, hey, these guys are getting what they need while these guys are getting what they need. Um, and I think it starts with just kind of the communication within our staff. You know, we we, we let each other know what, what's going to be happening, right? You know, there's times that, you know, we've got the sprinters, you know, running off of, uh, you know, the platform, right? You know, and so they're going into some running dives off, off of that into some, you know, quick kind of uh, speed changes, you know, uh, directional changes, you know, on a lot of rest. You know, so there's a lot of noise and laughter and like craziness that's taking place as you know as you said you know on the other side of the pool they're, they're cranking out you know blank you know blank set um yeah. so i think there's a lot of communication that goes into it you know amongst the staff that helps just the ease of it but i think it comes down to the team just kind of understanding that you know a guy like crooks is going to get what he needs um whereas a guy you know a, a guy like joey tepper um you know who, who's one of our open water guys and distance guys is getting what he needs you know it's just a, a respect of you know, different different people need different things. Yeah, no, I love it, man. Communication is key in that respect for sure. So, well, listen, man, I've enjoyed this. Uh, you know, congrats, congrats on all the success you're having at Tennessee, especially with Jordan, what he's doing. Um, I think everybody knows who he is now, and he's he's definitely on everybody's radar in terms of uh, 
what his capabilities are and, and and what he can do. I think it's it's going to be exciting to see him take that leap forward in in the long course pool as well. And that'll, that'll be your challenge. You know, he's obviously uh, an incredible underwater kicker. There's no doubt he can get to 15 faster than anyone. Uh, getting up and holding that speed now is going to be crucial in terms of that long course pool. So, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see what you do with him, man. So um, congrats and keep up the good work, all right? Yeah, thanks. I appreciate it. Um, it'll be a fun ride. Yeah, good luck this season, Tennessee. Uh, we'll be cheering for you, man, and I uh, hope it all works out, all right? Yeah, thanks. All right, thanks, Josh. Take care, man. Hey, all the best. I would like to tell a story of how Swim Angel Fish improved my skills and a major aspect of my life. Okay, and, and you are controlling on the whole time. First of all, when, when I was a small child, when I was like four years old, I had a fear of going in the water because I was afraid of getting my going, water going in my eyes and also the fear of drowning. No flippers. Okay, so you are going to Oh, yes. Let's finish this. I got gotcha. you. Good job. Did you see that time, how there was no discussion, and I just grabbed the opportunity in a much better way? Can you hold on the whole time? And touch and let go. Smile. Let me show you the smile. And when I got to the age of 11, I wanted to start, I wanted to start developing swimming skills because I noticed that a lot of my friends and peers have, are good at swimming. Well, let's show them how we learn to, I can now let go the whole way. The whole way? Yeah. So how about you're going to come around and see us from the whole way for your first time ever with not me touching you. Can I sit next to you? Yeah, of course. Oh, so excuse me. Excuse me. Oh, oh, oh. Are you okay or do you want me to touch you? Touch me. Last time, go, go. I swam a whole without anyone touching me. That is incredible. It is incredible. In conclusion, I think I would like to thank Swim Angel Fish for doing a great job of helping me develop confidence, bravery, and skill.